guys. So, if, when you guys are playing D and D, what's like your like your go-to like alignment? I don't want to go too much into alignment, but like like how how moral are your characters sometimes? You know, like if you had to come down to it, would you burn a village or something? You know what I mean? Like, or are you more of the goody two shoes? I don't really want to steal stuff. And, I mean. Uh, murder less and whatnot kind of character my thing on alignment is every dm pretty much sets what alignment means in their world but generally most of my characters are neutral good because it's like they're not gonna openly break laws but if it doesn't hurt anybody they might like jaywalk like that's not gonna hurt anybody okay, right? okay but they're not okay. gonna go out and murder random people most yeah of yeah the time. uh you know i've 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 played most of my D and D games with you guys. You know, I have characters of just about every type. I'm currently, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. until very recently, I've had two characters in the same game. Uh, one of them is that goody two shoes that doesn't really do anything wrong. The other one has gone on some murder sprees. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you know, I I feel like I can see both roads. Well, because today we're talking about some some very morally stereotypical classes i should say because you know we got we got paladin the 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 go-to goody two-shoes boy you know he 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 follows all the rules because if he don't then you know papa god up there is gonna be upset (laughs) and not not he's gonna take away his cool powers and give him other cool powers Because Oathbreaker's still not that bad. Um, <laughs> it's just not what you wanted, really, probably. <laughs> or, you know, we also got Rogue, you know, like the little sneaky guy that, that runs around. And he steals, steals stuff, and he he probably poisons people's food. He's an assassin, you know. And that. So, you know, we got, we got both of those. And then we also just kind of have the middle ground of, uh, you know, Ranger. <laughs> it exists. Yep. <laughs> because it's it's Ranger. Also, uh, Nuggies. Welcome to Traveler's Tips and Tales. <laughs> I am Jake. I'm Mike. And I'm Ben. And today we are doing Reclassed Episode 5, Part 3 of doing the subclasses. Today we're covering Paladin ranger and rogue and specifically uh, the ones from tasha's right yeah yeah the subclasses from that are added from tasha's cauldron of everything um we already went through the extra abilities and modifications that each of these classes have gotten especially ranger um (laughs) but yeah (laughs) so let's dive on into it then i guess yeah we got we got starting off with paladin we got the Oath of Glory is the first subclass for paladins. And um, like every paladin, they they come with tenants and whatnot. So the Path of Glory, the Oath of Glory tenants start out with actions over words. Strive to be known by glorious deeds, not words. You know, kind of like, uh, you know, actions speak louder than words kind of deal here. Um, tenant number two, challenges are but tests face hardships with courage and encourage your allies to face them with you um number three is uh hone the body like raw stone your body must be worked to its potential can be realized or so its potential can be realized and the last tenet for the oath of glory is discipline the soul you must marshal the discipline to overcome failings with yourself that threaten to dim the glory of you and your friends very very righteous stuff yeah so far this this feels like it would fit great in like a greek campaign if you were like Uh trying to be a famous demigod or something Mm. that would be or a famous hero this kind of sounds like that would be great let me tell you the abilities also help with that but but yeah i mean this is totally setting itself up to be you know very righteous and and worthy of a paladin and the abilities definitely help with that it, they, it definitely seems pretty glorious. Oh, yeah. Starting out with the spells, even, some of these spells are pretty pretty bonkers. 
Uh, starting at third level, you get Guiding Bolt and Heroism. These spells work a lot like cleric spells, where these they are not only added to your spell list, but are always prepared, so you don't have to worry about them. Um, starting at fifth level, you get to keep a Enhance Ability and Magic Weapon with you on at all times. At ninth level, you get third level spells with Haste and Protection from Energy. Coming in 13th level, when you get 4th level spells, you get Compulsion and Freedom of Movement. And then all the way at 17th level, the Climb, to get to 5th level spells you have, Caster, you get uh, Commune and Flame Strike. Some pretty good spells thrown in the mix there. Yeah, you know, those are pretty to, solid. Just to cover the quick ones of like Guiding Bolt, Enhance Ability, Haste, Freedom of Movement, Commune. All of those, pretty good. Some more you know combat based some more uh rp based but yeah all all really good stuff there i stand by my greek hero yeah uh, totally thing like you could totally do that just asking the gods for help casting yeah the closeness and like the closeness and connection to to the gods you know yeah you're, you're just odysseus <laughs> yeah like, you're like if you're like, you if you piss him off, yes. <laughs> just, just don't yeah. curse Poseidon. Even I better, mean, you're like you're like Hades, or not Hades, uh, Hercules. Hercules, yeah, Hercules, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Also, a lot like Hercules. Hercules, you get these channel videos here, and the first one's called Peerless Athlete. Um, as a bonus action, this is third level, by the way when you get your normal channel divinities. As a bonus action, you can use your channel divinity to augment your athleticism. Athleticism. For the next 10 minutes, you have advantage on strength athletics checks and dexterity acrobatics checks. You can carry, push, drag, and lift twice as much weight as normal, and the distance of your long and high jumps increases by 10 feet. This extra distance costs movement as normal. So you, you, you're not totally bonkers, you know. This, this extra jump distance doesn't come from nowhere. But, I mean, you could still jump pretty far and high. <laughs> Ooh, and, and it lasts for 10 that. minutes. And it lasts for 10 minutes, which is pretty nice. A lot of a lot of stuff can, like, like this, I feel like it lasts for, like, 8 minutes or so. Yeah. Or even but 8 dude, rounds sometimes. But yeah. Imagine multi-classing and combining that with the Barbarian Leap oh, ability. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The one that we were, we, the one that we were talking about, no. was kind of like force jumps. That's how you get Hercules right there. <laughs> oh yeah. And and we're not done here yet. We're not done here because you also oh, get Lord. a second option for channel divinities. It's called Inspiring Smite. Immediately after you deal damage to a creature with your Divine Smite feature, so you know you just handed it to somebody. <laughs> You can use your channel divinity as a bonus action and dis and distribute temporary hit points to creatures of your choice within 30 feet of you, which can include you. The total number of temporary hit points equals 2d8 plus your level in the class, divided among the chosen creatures however you like. So you could dish it up just perfectly. Maybe the maybe the frontline tank, you just give them as much as you can, and then you you know dish out the rest accordingly to the rest of the people who have been slightly damaged or whatever, you know? Mm hmm Maybe you have like you know a monk that still decides, yeah, I'm gonna tank things, and you know he goes through those hit points pretty quick. <laughs> Wonder who that monk could be though, you know? That'd be kind of weird. But yeah, so moving on into um, the next ability, this is one of my favorite paladin abilities all the time. It's just I always love that seventh level abilities because. When you get your auras, baby, auras could be OP. And this one, it does its work. Uh, the aura of alacrity, you emulate, uh, you emanate, sorry, an aura that fills you and your companions with supernatural speed, allowing you to, to race across a battlefield in formation. Your walking speed increases by 10 feet. In addition, if you aren't incapacitated, the walking speed of any ally who starts to turn within 5 feet of you increases by 10 feet until the end of that turn. When you reach 18th level in this class, the range of the aura increases to 10 feet. So it can, this one kind of works a little bit different because you still have your adding, to, adding your charisma modifier to all of your friends' saves within 10 feet, right? Yeah. But for this one, the 
the sideline aura that your your class does specifically has a smaller range, right? Of just the five feet rather than the full ten. And then at eighteenth level, when that ten feet for for the for the saving throws becomes thirty feet, this one becomes ten feet. So it's a lot smaller, but I mean it's a lot more of a precise of an ability anyway. So I don't think I would really be all that mad about it. No, nothing to be mad about with that at all. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're gaining movement speed, which is not a bad thing. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not complaining at all. You know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm dishing it out to my comrades too, in a, in a run, in a chase that could be helpful. Now my whole party, as long as we run, in a tight little unit <laughs> we run at 40 feet around instead of 30 so you know i'm, I'm chilling with that <laughs> um moving on to the 15th level ability for glory paladins though we have glorious defense you can turn defense into a sudden strike when you are another creature you can see uh within 10 feet of you is hit by an attack roll you could use your reaction to grant a bonus to that target's ac against that attack potentially causing it to miss the bonus equals your charisma modifier minimum of one if the attack misses you can make one weapon attack against the attacker as part of this reaction provided the attacker is within your range your weapons range you can use this feature a number of times equal to your charisma modifier minimum of once and you gain all expended uses when you finish a long rest this is super good because not only are you blocking an attack possibly with your with uh just adding up to you know anywhere from one to five based on your charisma mod not only are you blocking attack from either you or your friend but also you might be able to get an attack in on your as a reaction on your turn for free which is a uh, pretty neat i'm i'm a big fan of being able to do stuff that isn't my turn <laughs> you know having having a not my turn be just as big as during my turn <laughs> makes me feel confident you know i'm like yeah it's it always my fun. turn <laughs> it's always my turn <laughs> watch out <laughs> but yeah um moving on to the level 20 ability for the uh oath of glory paladin it the is called one living legend you can empower yourself with the legends whether true or exaggerated of your great deeds as a bonus action you gain the following benefits for one minute i'm kind of i'm kind of tipsy towing on this one i, I don't know how i feel about it quite yet um, but you are blessed with an otherworldly presence gaining advantage on all charisma checks sounds good right once on each of your turns when you make a weapon attack and miss, you can cause that attack to hit instead. Also sounds good on its own, right? And if you fail a saving throw, you can use your reaction to re-roll it. You must use this new roll. Also sounds good on its own. But here's what I ask you. Oh, also, you know, once you use this bonus action, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest unless you've expended a 5th level spell slot to use it again. The normal ballad and stuff. But... Now to talk about it, I don't know exactly how I feel about this because I kind of feel like they didn't make up their mind whether they wanted you to use this during combat or whether they wanted you to use it out of combat. The, the right. answer is yes. <laughs> but I feel like it could work better if they committed to one, right? Because it only lasts for one minute. If it was out of combat, it should last for like 10 minutes, I would say. Because a minute can be really tough sometimes during RP. Yeah. You know? You have to do turn-based roleplay. Yeah, because anything can get in your way for a minute. Where your character would reasonably just not be talking or something. You know, during that minute. Because something else is happening, and if you interrupt in RP, you know, that could do you worse than just not having the advantage or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? But also, you know, I don't know. But, I mean, the combat stuff is really good also. So, I guess I can still see it of being good for either. But, you know, I feel like they could if they just committed to combat or committed to RP, I feel like it could have been a lot better. Yeah. But that's just me. Maybe I'm, tr maybe I'm like, looking into it too much. 
I should just enjoy it. Because I do like it. I like both. I like all three of them. All three of the things, you know. But yeah. That's that's Oath of Glory. I agree with, with you, Ben. Um, it does have a lot of, like, Greek, like, like just, like, honor and and glory, I guess you could say. I'm kind of sad know. that my sad pun went it. underappreciated earlier. Yeah? I'm not gonna oh, lie. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, I guess I just had to wait till now. It's glorious! <laughs> It's yeah, I, I heard the pun mm -hmm. and I just I just face palmed at it and left it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I demand recognition. <laughs> All the listeners loved it. All the listeners loved it. It's for sure. <laughs> Moving on, I, though. I bet you before he even gets this part, Dalton sends us a video of him in the car listening to it, laughing at that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Him laughing at the first part when you actually said it. Yeah. The second subclass, though, for paladins, I also like this one, is called the Oath of the Watchers. So let's start out with all of uh, uh, the same way we start out all of our paladin subclasses and cover over the tenants real quick. This one only has three instead of the usual four. So. There's that, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> um, starting out with the first tenet of vigilance. The threats you face are cunning, powerful, and subver subversive, but ever alert for their corruption. Or be ever alert for their corruption. Um, second, number two is loyalty. Never accept gifts or favors from uh, fiends or those who truck with them. Stay true to your order, your comrades, and your duty. And discipline. You are the shield against the, the endless terrors that lie beyond the stars. Your blade must forever uh, must be forever sharp, and your mind keen to survive what lies beyond. It's pretty uh, noble stuff, if you ask me. You know, it's kind of interesting. But yeah, so those are the tenets, just to give you an idea of like what kind of paladin this could be right out the gate. You know, for RP wise. Moving into the the um, the spells that you get. Starting at third level, you get alarm and detect magic, both pretty good. Um, fifth level, you get moonbeam and see invisibility, again, both pretty good. Ninth level, you get third level spells, literally my favorite third level spell, probably the whole game, counter spell and non detection. Moving on to fourth level spells, we have aura of purity and banishment coming in at thirteenth level. And at 17th level, we've got Hold, Monster, and Scrying. Pretty good, uh, pretty good lineup here. I like all of these spells, pretty much. <laughs> I don't think there's any of these spells that I don't like. <laughs> like, you even get Banishment in there, and that's like, oof, yikes. But anyways, starting at 3rd level, you also get Channel Divinities. And this one, as well, comes with two. So the first Channel Divinity is Watcher's Will. You can use your channel of entity to invest uh, to invest your presence with the warding power of your fate. As an action, you can choose the number of creatures you can see within 30 feet of you, up to a number equal to your charisma modifier, minimum of one creature, for one minute. You and the chosen creatures have advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. Super good. Also, the second channel of entity, Abjur the Extra Planar. You can use your channel of entity to castigate unworldly beings as an action you can present your holy symbol in each aberration celestial uh, elemental fey or fiend within 30 feet of you that can hear you must make a wisdom saving throw on a failed save the creature is tuned uh, turned for one minute or until it takes damage a turned creature must spend its time trying to move as far away from you as it can and it can't willingly enter its move in a space within 30 feet of you for its action it can use only the dash action or try to escape from an effect that prevents it from moving if there's nowhere to move the creature can take the dodge action um i kind of like both of these they're both a little situational so i don't think you're using these every day but you know that's okay <laughs> You don't need to use your channel of entities every single day because I think when you are going to use these, these are going to be very clutch, especially that Watcher's Will one. 
that's pretty good. So far, so good, man. Not gonna lie. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I I consider playing this, but like, I think I need to know a little bit more. Okay, okay. Let me try and get you more on board then. Moving on to that aura ability at level seven, you emit an aura of alertness while you aren't incapacitated. When you and any <laughs> creatures of your <laughs> choice within ten feet of you roll initiative. You gain a bonus to initiative equal to your proficiency bonus. At 18th level, the range of this aura increases to 30 feet. There you go. Now, your whole party is more likely to roll before the bad guys. I like this especially because it doesn't it doesn't mess with like individual initiatives, right? Because because at first you look at it and you're like, oh well, what if the cleric doesn't want to go last? Right? Or or what if the cleric doesn't want to go first? Right? But hypothetically, everyone in your party should get this bonus. So it should be the same whether they got it or not. They would have the same order. You're just making everyone a little bit earlier in the initiative. Hopefully above the monsters, obviously. Right? I'm not going to lie. All I got mm -hmm. from that is caffeine aura. <laughs> <laughs> if you're within 10 feet of me you get jittery <laughs> <laughs> or you know what no we're gonna call it cocaine aura this is the drugged out oh boy <laughs> this is the the it's oath the, of drugs that's what this is it's the, it's the oath of crackhead <laughs> <laughs> may i interest you in my religion <laughs> what's your religion I'm interested. <laughs> he sneezes and, and spells just stop working around him because he counter spells. <laughs> he's been high for so long that he just sees magic. Anyways, because he's got to spell magic. You know, that was the joke. Anyways, Vigilant Rebuke at 15th level. <laughs> You've learned how to chastise anyone who dares wield beguilements against you and your wand, uh, wards. Whenever you or a creature you can see within 30 feet of you succeeds on intelligence, a wisdom, or a charisma saving throw, you can use your reaction to deal 2d8 plus your charisma modifier force damage to the creature that forced the saving throw. You know, the Watchers kind of feels like they're pretty set up against anything that casts spells. <laughs> I was going to say everything. <laughs> anything that casts spells. You know what? I take it back. I don't think they're the drugged out paladins. I don't. You don't? You know what I think they really are? Okay. They're the magical neighborhood watch. <laughs> that is exactly what they are. That is exactly They stay up what all they night are. with their friends, drinking coffee, watching. And if they I love see it any because... kind of magical shenanigans, they're just like, no. <laughs> I love it because the, the art... The art in Tasha's, I'm looking at it right now, for, for it has a art of a of a Watcher's Paladin, and it just looks like a normal dude, but their eyes are just like woke. <laughs> They're just like glowing white. It's just like that's the only thing. They're just like they just got a cool normal sword, they got a shield, and then their eyes are just like, I see you, bruh. <laughs> like, see probably it just, it just kinda sounds to me. Like Wizards of the Coast is like, guys, we we need something that's like a, a martial class that kind of counters magic. And then mm -hmm. they heard they heard our podcast and they saw the uh, the one shot with the anti mage that Ben drew up, and they're like, <laughs> that but paladin, that but paladin, make them holy, <laughs> make that man a a follower of God. <laughs> something i don't know and that's anyways my, that's my story i'm sticking to it even though our one shot came out after this book definitely definitely <laughs> because we definitely didn't use a subclass that's in this book in that exact one shot <laughs> <laughs> nope uh, hashtag burb anyways uh level 20 ability for the watchers we're already here guys what a long what a long trip but here we are at the at the end of the road uh, it's called Mortal Bulwark. Uh, you manifest a spark of divine power in defense of the moral realm or mortal realms. Did I say moral or mortal? I said mortal, right? 
Yes. Is that the title of the, the ability? I couldn't remember at that point. I was like, wait a second. Did I say moral? Okay. As a bonus action, you gain the following benefits for one minute. I'll probably leave that in. That was funny. Uh, you gain true sight with a range of 20 feet. Or not, not 20 feet. 120 feet. My bad. You have advantage on attack rolls against aberrations, celestials, elementals, fe- fey, and fiends. And also, when you hit a creature with an attack roll and deal damage to it, you can also force it to make a charisma saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failed save, the creature is magically banished to its native plane of existence if it's currently not there. On a successful save, the creature can't be banished by this feature for 24 hours. Once you use this bonus action, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest unless you expend a 5th level spell slot to use it again. Now, boys, please tell me anywhere in that ability did it say you cannot do this twice in the same turn <laughs> for that last little check mark there. You know, I I didn't hear it. You didn't hear it because I didn't read it because it wasn't there. So <laughs> this paladin could banish things multiple times on his turn, guys. For a minute, he's just he's just bamfing homies out of here. Get out of here! I I hit you with my sword, and you're out. Go away. Banished to the shadow realm, my guy. Gone. Kaput. Because these are also most likely, you know, against an aberration, a celestial, an elemental, a fey, a fiend. These homies ain't from this plane, so they ain't coming back. <laughs> Most likely, you know. So, all I'm saying is, it sounds like this paladin can just be like cleaning up house. <laughs> Bye, pretty shit. You know, he's just exactly. He's just like, get out of here, homie. Not in my house. <laughs> he's just like, <sighs> are you sold on this paladin yet, Ben? Did I do it? it it's pretty tempting. It's pretty tempting, isn't it? It's pretty tempting, but you know what's even more tempting than that? Hmm. P- playing. P- playing. R- <laughs> playing. Uh, r- yeah. Playing. Uh, yeah. All right, Michael. Well, Ben tries to figure this out for himself. Um, <laughs> oh no, 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 no! I want him to say it. And I think I think he might get there. Let's just give him some time to, to dwell on it, right? Let's let's see what they did with Ranger over here, Michael. Yeah. So <laughs> let's see if they here, see here's if they the really thing, right? The so pieces. as as the person on this podcast that pretty much is the only person who talks about Ranger, <laughs> whenever we have something to talk about for Ranger, um, these these subclasses actually are not bad. If it oh, okay, wasn't okay. for the rest of like the ranger base class being absolute just horrible mess, I would probably play these. Okay. So I mean, there's that. Um the, right. the first one that we have here is uh Fey Wanderer. And you know, if if you've looked in these books, you know that anytime there's a there's an archetype for a class, which is basically just a subclass uh th- there's a little quote in these books <laughs> and i really like this one because this one's just hilarious to me it- it's a quote from tasha uh it says do you think a kilt is a vital part of the fey wandering aesthetic and if not why are you so wrong <laughs> and i just appreciate that <laughs> yeah as someone who has never worn a kilt but is Irish, I could appreciate it. Dude, it's gotta be comfy. It's gotta be, to be honest. It's like a cargo skirt for men. <sighs> Mike? Skirt. Yeah. Hey, Mike? Yeah. Do you think kilts are Irish? No, I, didn't I think wanna, they're Scottish. I didn't want to I didn't want to hit him with it. Okay? But Ireland is very close slide. to Scotland. And they're so very I, was different. Just, I was just I was just <laughs> very different. Just, just, just give it to me, okay? No. <laughs> I was just going to let him slide, but... Um, no. <laughs> but a really nice thing about the Fey Wanderer is at third level, you get a whopping three abilities. 
Ooh, you get three abilities here. Uh, the first one is okay. called Dreadful Strikes. You can augment your weapon strikes with mind-scarring magic drawn from the gloomy hollows of the Feywild. When you hit a creature with a weapon, you can deal an extra 1d4 psychic damage to the target, which can take this extra damage only once per turn. The extra damage increases to 1d6 when you reach 11th level in this class. Dude, All right. you can deal psychic damage. Just any time you hit a creature. That's, that's, that's the some... rarest type of damage in this game. Yeah. True. That's awesome. I like it. Well, I mean, I don't know. I guess we got to recalculate how rare damages are now that Tasha's is out. Because Probably. A lot of what Tasha's did was, hey, you want some psychic? <laughs> hey, you want yeah. some brain powers? <laughs> true. Here you go. <laughs> Previously, the rarest form of damage in the game. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. For um, sure. Also, at third level, you get Fey Wanderer Magic. You learn an additional spell when you reach certain levels in this class, as shown on the Fey Wanderer spells table. Each spell counts as a ranger spell for you, but does not count against the number of ranger spells you know. At third level, you get Charm Person. At fifth level, you get Misty Step. At ninth level, you get to spell nice. magic. Thirteenth well, level, you get Dimension Door. And seventeenth level, so you far? get Mislead. All right. Those are all pretty solid. That's that's pretty nice. I can I can get behind those spells, uh, especially you know, Misty Step and Dimension Door. I think it's really funny that this is the second ability that they bring up <laughs> instead of the first one. Yeah. Because normally, like when they do this kind of stuff, where they're like, "You get these spells added to your spell list, and it's they're always like the prepared." First thing they say. It's normally the first thing that they say for the subclass. They're like. Here you go, you're in the subclass, boom, spells. Yeah. But this one is like, you're such a small caster that they're just like, ah, it's not that important. Give them the dreadful strikes first. Then we'll tell them about the magic yeah. stuff. <laughs> I just uh, think that's funny. But also with Fey Wanderer Magic, you get a you get a little aesthetic for your character. Okay? You get a little bit you get a little bit of flavor. Uh okay. you also possess a preternatural blessing from a Fey ally or a place of Fey power. Choose your blessing from the Feywild gifts table or determine it randomly. Uh, it's a D6 table ranging from, you know, butterflies fluttering around you, flowers or antlers growing out of your hair. Um, just just kind of some cool stuff, you know? You smell like lavender. <laughs> or cinnamon or nutmeg or another comforting herb or spice. You got a Peter Pan shadow that dances. Yeah, that one I really like. Your shadow dances when no one is looking directly at it. <laughs> That's just funny to me. Yeah. Uh, and then also at third level, you get otherworldly glamour. Your fake qualities give you a supernatural charm. As a result, whenever you make a charisma check, you gain a bonus to the check equal to your wisdom modifier, minimum of plus one. In addition, you gain proficiency in one of the following skills of your choice, deception, performance, or persuasion. If you already have proficiency in all three of those, you're just kind of out of luck. You don't get any bonus there. But I don't think you're able to, unless it's through backgrounds. Yeah. Um, I think intimidation is the only charisma um, ability that rangers have access to from the start, I believe. I don't remember off the top of my head. They have to be mean. Nope, not even <laughs> that. They have none of the charisma stuff. Uh, seventh level. I mean, it's 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 kind of nice. I think that it's it's kind of the lackluster ability of this subclass. Okay. Uh, it's called beguiling twist. The magic of the Feywild guards your mind. You have advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. Nice. In addition, whenever you or a creature you can see within 120 feet of you succeeds on a saving throw against being charmed or frightened, you can use your reaction to force a different creature you can see within 120 feet of you to make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC. If the spell fails, the target is charmed or frightened by you, your choice, for one minute. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a successful one. Michael, you don't like this ability that much? I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm not a huge like charm and frighten kind of person. Picture this. Picture this, Michael. A homie walks up to a dragon. Dragon said, "Hey, look at me. I'm big and scary. You gonna make a saving throw? Cause I'm big and scary." And he says, "All right, chief. I'm gonna do that." 
he somehow passes. And now you're just like, hey, dragon, I need you to make a wisdom saving throw. And the dragon says, what? <laughs> you said, you heard me. This dragon says, oh, okay, I'll make a wisdom saving throw. He might pass it. He might not, though. And if he doesn't, you could be like, hey, dragon, I don't even care about frightening you. I want you to be charmed by me. <laughs> yeah, what are you, a bard? <laughs> I mean, I don't <laughs> care. This, this is this is the bard of ranger subclasses. Though. For real. Let's be real. Yeah. One of the things lets you just smell like lavender all the time. That's too super bard. All right. So at 11th level, <laughs> you get fey reinforcements. Uh, the royal courts of the fey wild have blessed you with the assistance of fey beings. You know, summon fey, which is a spell in chapter three of this book. It's also a third level spell. Uh, it does not count against the number of ranger spells you know, and you can cast it without a material component. You can also cast it once without a spell slot, and you regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. Now, this is the next part. Uh, this this is the part that I really like about this. Whenever you start casting the spell, you can modify it so that it does not require concentration. If you do so, the spell's duration becomes one minute instead of its usual one hour for that casting. No, Most combat's duration. gonna be done in less than a minute. The spell's duration becomes one minute instead of one hour. But yeah, but no concentration. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. That's pretty. That's pretty bonkers. Most combat's gonna last you less than a minute, and you now just have basically another creature fighting with you. I mean, you get to you get to cast it once a day for free, right? Not even using the spell slot, so yeah. And a day, might as well do it just to hang out with the homie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do it yet. Yeah, I I really like that because I like being able to summon things to help in battle, and to be able to just kind of do that without concentration, or mm -hmm. using a spell slot, or components. Yeah, that's I mean that's lit. good. That's good, but I'm still kind of hooked on this beguiling twist. I mean, like that doesn't even happen on your turn, Michael. <laughs> See, I'm just, I'm just not huge on the whole charmed or frightened. You, I, I don't, charmed, I don't care as much about those myself. You charmed something else, and it wasn't even your turn, man. That's wild to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not that kind of player. I'm not, I'm not like super into those. I guess. <laughs> So it's 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 lackluster to me. Let me let me phrase it that way. All you right. might you might very much so enjoy that. That might be your favorite feature of this class. Not I'm me. just saying you play a lot of parts and I don't play any. <laughs> We're talking about charming here. So anyways. Uh yeah, the fifteenth level, the last feature that you get <laughs> from this class, is Misty Wanderer. You can slip in and out of the Feywild to move in the blink of an eye. You can cast Misty Step without expending a spell slot, and you can do this a number of times equal to your Wisdom modifier, minimum one, and you Very regain handy. all expended uses when you finish a long rest. In addition, whenever you cast Misty Step, you can bring along one willing creature you can see within five feet of you. That creature Better. teleports to an unoccupied space of your choice within five feet of your destination space. I really like that. Yeah, that's that, that's good. also really good. That's super good. You're you're an Aladrin, but buffed. I think I might say it, Michael. I think I might say it. I think that this ranger is good enough to where I'd play a ranger. See, I just I just, just don't maybe. know if it if it overpowers the base class abilities. That's I don't my know. problem. These... <laughs> These subclass abilities are really cool. Hey, listen, you only got to go fifteen because that's when you stop getting stuff from subclasses, and that's then true. you just then you just bail out of there. You and then you just, five you, just you just else. go to like fighter Druid. or monk or, or rogue barbarian, Druid so you can rogue. get uh, double attack. <laughs> Stay in the theme and go Druid or rogue, or you could do Ancient's Paladin, keeping the Fey kind of area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is the Fey Wanderer. Uh, the next one is Swarm Keeper. All right, this one level spell slots though. Not quite as good, but still I think up there. This one is still 
almost as good. Some right. of its abilities <laughs> definitely beat out the Fey Wanderer, but some of its abilities kind of meh. Okay. Um, well, let's let's see it. Let's see. It. Uh, first of all, you only get two things at third level. Loser. Uh, the first one is called <laughs> Gathered Swarm. A uh, swarm of intangible nature spirits has bonded itself to you and can assist you in battle. Until you die, the swarm remains in your space, crawling on you or flying and skittering around you within your space. You determine its appearance or you generate its appearance by rolling on the swarm appearance table, which is just a D4 table in the book that has swarming insects, miniature twig blights, fluttering birds, or playful pixies. Little cute stuff. Yeah. Once on each of your turns, you can cause the swarm to assist you in one of the following ways immediately after you hit a creature with an attack. Uh, the first option, the attack's target takes 1d6 piercing damage from the swarm. Nice. Pretty neat. Uh, the D6. attack's target must succeed on a strength saving throw against your spell save DC or be moved by the swarm up to 15 feet horizontally in a direction of your choice. That's a lot of feet in a direction of your choice. That is. Uh, or you are moved by the swarm five feet horizontally in a direction of your choice. Mm, now my question to you is, does that provoke opportunity attack? Yes, it does, because it does not specify otherwise. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. But I mean, you could just add a d6 to your damage. <laughs> so Or just move your enemy to right in front of your barbarian or monk. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna... I don't think I'm ever gonna use that third one but also yeah. like i like the other two so much that i wouldn't have cared if the third one just wasn't written there so. but that being said <laughs> later on in this subclass you will get uh some extra stuff added onto those so oh okay okay we'll, okay. we'll, we'll get back to those we'll, a little we'll, bit later. we'll hold we'll hold the tab on that yeah. and then we'll, we'll we'll draw back to it one day also at third level you get swarm keeper magic you learn the oh, yeah, mage the hand cantrip if you don't already know it when you cast it, the hand takes the form of your swarming nature spirits. You oh, also learn cute. an additional spell of first level or higher when you reach certain levels in this class, as shown in the Swarm Keeper spells table. Each spell counts as a ranger spell for you, but it does not count against the number of ranger spells you know. At third level, fairy fire and mage hand. Fifth level, web. Interesting. Ninth okay. level, gaseous form. Thirteenth oh, level, right. arcane eye. And seventeenth okay. level, my favorite, insect plague. All right. You know these these ones are kind of uh, interesting choices. They're not they're not kind of in line with the uh, the normal picks for these kind of this kind of ability. But I mean, I could see how it fits so well with uh, the Swarm Keeper, anyway. So yeah, it's it's very on theme. I'm yeah, it's very on theme, which makes me not want to be mad about it. But like, it's interesting choices for the spells. I yeah. guess I could just say. At 7th level, you get Writhing Tide. You can condense part of your swarm into a focused mass that lifts you up. As a bonus action, you gain a flying speed of 10 feet and can hover. This effect All lasts right. for 1 minute or until you are incapacitated. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. I mean, it'd be nice if you had like a 25 feet minimum flying speed <laughs> i mean this is like gaseous form two levels before you get gaseous form if you ask me yeah except you can't like do the thing where like you know you could fit through tiny little cracks in the wall because you're gas <laughs> yeah. i feel like with this class gaseous form is actually a form of insects yeah, I mean, ha having yeah. the ability to flavor it if your DM allows you to, it's always It's just nice. like you turn into a million insects. <laughs> Personalize your spells, guys. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, this this is definitely like my least favorite feature from this class. Uh, I still like it. I mean, it gives you flying speed. I'm okay with that. Ye gods, a flying ranger. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's nice to have the flying speed, but it's it's just so low. I don't like yeah. it that much. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, and it takes your bonus action, so which is On better than it taking turns. an action, I guess. Yeah, it's 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 your bonus action, and then your 
flying for the next 10 rounds. Uh, at 11th level, this is where you get the boost to those three things from your third level ability. So this one's ah, called Mighty okay, Swarm. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, your Gathered Swarm grows mightier in the following ways. Uh, the damage can increase to 1d8. All right. Uh, if the creature fails the saving throw against being moved by the gathered swarm, you can also ca- you can also cause the swarm to knock the creature prone. All right. All right. Uh, and finally, when you are moved by gathered swarm, it gives you half cover until the start of your next turn. Oh, okay. So okay. It, it makes so... that third one just a little bit better. Hey, but you might I still take really an like attack... that first and second. You might take an attack of opportunity, but at least it'll be harder to hit. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it just made the first and second one even better. Yeah. Um, And then the last thing you get from this class is 15th level, Swarming Dispersal. And this one I really like. You All can right. discorporate into your swarm, avoiding danger. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to give yourself resistance to that damage. You vanish into your swarm and then teleport to an unoccupied space that you can see within 30 feet of you where you reappear with the swarm. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. You just got Misty Step with just damage reduction. Yeah, it reminds me of the Warlock subclass. Which one is it? It's the Fey one. I can't remember what it's called. Um, Pack to the Pack to the Arch Fey, I guess. Probably right. It's like one of the like level three ability. I think anytime you take damage, <clears throat> yeah, you can teleport thirty feet. But yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, this just does the same thing except instead of taking no damage, you take half damage. But also that makes sense because of the thematics behind it, right? This is a swarm instead of Archfey BS going on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like the swarm is kind of it's taking the brunt you. of the attack. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I like I said, these subclasses I think are really good and come close to making me want to play Ranger. I'm just not sure if they're quite there yet. <laughs> this does give me an idea, though. Oh, I'm okay. definitely using these subclasses as, like, bosses. Well, I would love to play a Swarm Keeper that's actually a vampire that uses bats instead oh, of bugs. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Here's my question for you boys. For the Swarm... For the, the, the Gathered Swarm ability and the mm-hmm. Mighty Swarm ability as well, I guess. When you add the damage um to the attack roll it says it says in it right uh the attacks target takes so the attacks target could be from a ranged attack is what's your what's your status on that i i instead of i mean I, the way i see it it makes sense what of this looking at this like most likely is you're hitting them with a the sword right because that kind of makes sense because you're up close and personal. The swarm is around you, and then the swarm does this thing, which makes me think that it's up close and personal, right? But would you allow the ranger to do this kind of stuff with a bow and arrow? Oh, which 100%. Which is an important question to ask. I'd, I'd say the swarm uh, has a little section of it kind of break off the swarm onto sure, the sure. arrow as it flies through the air, as it leaves yeah. your space. They trail behind it. Following. Yeah, they, they trail behind it, ready to uh, latch right. on to the right. blood that what is released you, from your enemy. I, I think Ranger needs all the help it can get, I say, yeah. That's fair. That's fair. I respect <laughs> that. I respect that answer. That's basically my answer as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to party poop, you know, so. Yeah, I, 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 wanted to, say... I wanted to go beyond just like, oh, Ranger needs help. I wanted to like actually make it in a sensible way work so that way well, I mean, anybody who's on the fence be like okay yeah fair enough here's here's my sensible way of reasoning it it doesn't say otherwise in the that's book that's true so i'm gonna say sure go ahead <laughs> but yeah that is that is it for the ranger you know guys yes sometimes i think we're a little too hard on ranger yeah that's right, I said it. 
I I can agree with that statement. Because I think we really need to hound down on why Rogue is so broken. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob's like, no, don't touch my Rogue. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 I don't, I don't agree anymore. <laughs> yeah, Rogue, uh, they're so broken, and they just got even more broken with the two new subclasses that they got. Hey, that's okay. Tosses. That's okay, that's fine. They're so broken that they only got one ability from Tasha's, an optional one, that is <laughs> only and one. And all it does all it does is a level two ability, isn't it? Or three. It's three. It's a level it, three ability. And it's, it's really where... not that big of a difference. Oh, yeah, I can tell like... you that it is actually. Really? I mean the aim, it yeah. It's I've been using good. it a lot. Huh. It is so good. Because sometimes I mean that's like that's like the worst thing about being rogue is like sometimes there's nothing to hide behind. How do you get your advantage? True, true. You know? yeah. well, sometimes actually, it could be really tough to get that advantage. You know so what's just, messed up? Now you're just like, all right, I'll stand still. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. You know what's messed up actually though? Sometimes huh. when I'm playing, Anna doesn't even let me have advantage when I'm sneaking. Oof. Wow. Oof. So aim has become a crucial part of my build. Woof. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I guess it'd be like that sometimes, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, bro. It's okay. Uh, I I kick ass. I can't even lie. <laughs> uh, the only one that does more damage than me is the Barbarian, somehow. But they did get two new subclasses. They got Phantom. Dun, dun, right. dun. Yes, Phantom. Because they weren't edgy enough. <laughs> Phantoms have unlocked the power of death. They bring death to their enemies and collect them like trinkets. Their souls are just toys for these rogues, all right? At level three, you get two abilities. First one is Whispers of the Dead. Echoes of those who have died cling to you because you're edgy. Whenever you finish a short or long <laughs> rest, you could choose one skill or tool proficiency that you lack and gain it as a ghostly presence shares its knowledge with you. You lose this proficiency when you use this feature to choose a different proficiency that you lack. Bro, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. What? Dude. Yep. Alright. Alright, Chief, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right, not boys. all. Uh, also at level 3, wails from the grave. As you nudge someone closer to the grave, metaphorically, not literally, you can channel the power of death and harm someone else as well. Immediately oh, after you deal your sneak attack right. damage to a creature on your turn, you can target a second creature you can see within 30 feet of the first creature. Roll half the number of sneak attack dice for your level, round up. Oh my gosh. And the second creature takes necrotic damage equal to that roll's total as whales of the dead surround them for a moment. And you can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Bro. Yep. <sighs> you got nerfed sneak attack again. <laughs> yep. Some guy you didn't even hit. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm so edgy that I stabbed this guy over here, and this other guy way over there. Got felt so, it. <laughs> yeah, he was like, he was like, oh my goodness, I can yep. feel the, I can feel the death entering this man's. <laughs> but next, at level nine, this is a very important feature: tokens of the departed. Okay, okay. When a life ends in your presence, you're able to snatch a token from the departing soul, a sliver of its life essence that takes a physical form. As a reaction, when a creature you can see dies within thirty feet of you. You can open your free hand and cause a tiny trinket to appear there. A soul trinket. Dun dun dun! <laughs> the DM determines the trinket's form or has you roll on the trinket table in the player's handbook to generate it. You can have a maximum number of soul trinkets equal to your proficiency bonus and you can't create one while at your maximum. You can use soul trinkets in the following ways. There's three ways. While a soul trinket is on your person, you have advantage on death saving throws and constitution saving throws, for your vitality is enhanced by the life essence within the object. 
Is that count. like a is that like a passive one that doesn't use up the That's trinket? That's passive. Either? That's passive. All right. It doesn't use up the trinket. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. And you can have eventually up to six of these bad boys. Yep. All when right. you deal sneak attack damage on your turn, you can destroy one of your soul trinkets that's on your person and then immediately use whales from the grave without expending a use of that feature. Ooh. And if you Ooh. kill that guy, guess what? You can snatch his soul and use it again. <laughs> Ooh. And finally, as an action, you can destroy one of your soul trinkets no matter where it's located. When you do so... You can ask the spirit associated with the trinket one question. The spirit answers to you and answers in a language it knew in life. It's under no obligation to be truthful, and its answers are con as concise as possible, eager to be free. The spirit knows only what it knew in life as determined by the DM. That's interesting. Because, like, if someone were to cast Zone of Truth in that area, would that work? Probably not. Probably not. Because it only yeah. exists long enough to answer the one question, and then it's gone. Uh-huh. Hmm. But yeah, you can just ask questions of people you just murdered. True. Dude, now you don't have to, like, keep captives. After You don't have to, like, non-lethal people just to ask them what's going well, on. You, you, you should if you want more than one no, answer. No, 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 no. We're an adventuring party. We murder people here. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, is... you, you can murder him after well, he answers multiple questions. Well, there's an happens. easier, okay, guys. There's an job. easier way to interrogate people. Oh, really? You can use your thirteenth level ability, Ghost Walk, to sneak into their house. Oh, oh okay, cool. Sounds good. You can phase partially into the realm of the dead, becoming like a ghost. As a bonus action, you assume a spectral form. While in this form, you have a flying speed of ten feet. You can hover, and attack rolls have disadvantage against you. You can also move through creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain, but you take 1d10 force damage if you end your turn inside a creature or an object. You stay in this form for 10 minutes or until you end it as a bonus action. To use this feature again, you must finish a long rest or destroy one of your soul trinkets as part of the bonus action you use to activate Ghostwalk. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Bro, you straight up haunting the homies just because... Yeah, haunting the homies. <laughs> <laughs> you just become a ghost. I don't know what more you want me to say, man. You just... You're a ghost. Once a day, once a day, you're a ghost for ten minutes because you just, you just well, feel... Once like... a day or up to seven times a day or unless you kill more people and then you get more uses. I mean, who's to know? Who's to know? <laughs> and at if level you, 17... If you, if you work fast enough, you might just always be a ghost. <laughs> Yeah. If you work fast and efficiently enough. Yep. It's just At a lot of 17. murder that goes on. <laughs> At level 17. You become Death's friend. You get a friend. The first one in your life, probably. And... Your association with Death has become so close that you gain the following benefits. When you use your whales from the grave, you can deal the necrotic damage to both the first and second creature. Oh, <laughs> so that means you get one and a half sneak attacks. <laughs> Your good ability just got even better. Yep. Hey, but you and... gotta you gotta roll them you gotta roll them separately. You gotta keep in mind which is which because some is necrotic and some is, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. damage you do. But at the end of a long rest, a soul trinket appears in your hand if you don't have any soul trinkets, as the spirits of the dead are drawn to you. Oh, okay. So if you if you had one, you don't get a new one. No. You don't get two. But if you have but zero, you will get one. You will get one. Just a little head start, you know? I I do like this one. It's very, very edgy, though. <laughs> yeah, just very a bit. Edgy. <laughs> it's so edgy. <laughs> you, know what I, you know what this kind of wants... To me to make me want to do i don't think that sentence made any sense but i'm just gonna roll with it i want to make like a phantom rogue that's like super not edgy they just like don't realize what's going on around them like they don't <laughs> realize like the severity of what they're doing they're just like yeah these are my friends they give me little gifts <laughs> <laughs> and i don't like 
I don't like it when people aren't my friends, you know. I don't like me. Be people, the perfect so. BBEG. Oh yeah. Oh god. Hey Ben, can I just be your next BBEG? Maybe we'll think about just it. A, just a just a Phantom Rogue. <laughs> well, I'll do you one better than Phantom Rogue. Okay, okay, okay. Put a little bit of Mystic in your Rogue. Gasp! Soul. How knife. dare you? How dare you? <laughs> A psionic rogue that kills you with their mind. <laughs> oh, good. The ultimate assassin. Wait, I thought that was inquisitive. I'm just kidding. <laughs> At level three, with the soul knife okay. subclass, you get psionic power. That's what it's called. You harbor a wellspring of psionic energy within yourself. This energy is represented by your psionic energy dice, which are each a d6. You have a number of these dice equal to twice your proficiency bonus, and they fuel various psychic powers you have, which are detailed below. Some of your powers oh expend the psionic energy die they use, as specified in the power's description, and you can't use a power if it requires you to use a die when all your dice are expended, and you regain them all when you finish a long rest. And, as a bonus action, you can regain one expended psionic energy die, but you can't do so again until you finish a shorter long rest. And as you level up, they get bigger. At 5th level, they become a D8. At 11th level, they become a D10. And at 17th level, they become D12s. Okay. These next ones... This is a lot, so I'm trying to go through it kind of quick. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The the next couple abilities uh, that you can use with your psionic power, I will now uh, let you guys... I'll, I'll, I'll read it off for you guys. Psy Bolstered Knack. That's what it says. Okay. Knack. Yep. When your non-psionic training fails you, your psionic power can help. If you fail an ability check using a skill or tool with which you have proficiency, you can roll one psionic energy die and add the number rolled to the check, potentially turning failure into success. You expend the die only if the roll succeeds. Ooh, that's that's where it gets good. Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't even you don't even lose it if it. There's no point in not doing it. Yeah. Right? Pretty much. <laughs> because it says if you fail the abilities check. So that means if the DM says you didn't pass, yep. then you go, no, no, sir. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I'm no, no, no. I've got the special dice for this. And then you roll a one, and then you look at the DM, and he goes, you didn't pass. You're like, all right, that's fine. I get to keep the dice, though. And he's like, well, that's what well, then you go. <laughs> yeah. You also get psychic whispers. You can establish telepathic communication between yourself and others. Perfect for quiet, quiet infiltration. As an action, <laughs> choose one or more creatures you can see, up to a number of creatures equal to your proficiency bonus, and then roll one psychic psionic energy die. For a number of hours equal to the number rolled. Hours, by the way. Mm -hmm. The joke. Mm -hmm. The chosen creatures can speak telepathically with you, and you can speak telepathically with them. To send or receive a message, no action required. You and the other creature must be within one mile of each other. The creature can't use this telepathy if it can't speak any languages, <clears throat> and a creature uh, can end the telepathic connection at any time, no action required. You and the creature don't need to speak a common language to understand each other. The first time you use this power, after each long rest, you don't expend the psionic energy die. All other times you use the power, you must expend the die. What? Yep. You know, I was I was looking at this, and I was thinking, like, it sounds like you have a lot of the dice, right? Because you have twice the number of your proficiency bonus, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, you start off with four, and your end game is 12. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's four at level three, right? You know, and you only yeah. have four for two levels, and then you, you get you get up to six now. But, like, your end game is 12, and, like, what are you using these on? Because a well, bunch of the well, times you don't even expend them. Let me tell you. You're okay. using them on psychic blades. That's, that's fair. All right. You can manifest your psionic power as shimmering blades of psychic energy. When you take the attack action, you can manifest a psychic blade from your free hand and make the attack with that blade. This magic blade is a simple melee weapon with the finesse and throne properties. 
It has a normal range of 60 feet and no long range. And on a hit, it deals psychic damage equal to 1d6 plus the ability modifier you used for the attack roll. The blade vanishes immediately after it hits or misses its target, and it leaves no mark on its target if it deals damage. After you attack with the blade, you can make a melee or ranged weapon attack with a second psychic blade as a bonus action on the same turn, provided your other hand is free to create it. The damage die of this bonus attack is 1d4 instead of 1d6. Okay, alright. Psychic blades. <laughs> psychic blades. Yes. But and that level that level specifically doesn't use no dice, correct? You're correct, but you get more things you can do it with at level 9. I see, I see. Yes. So here we go. So, level 9, Soul Blades. Mm -hmm. Your psychic blades are now an expression of your psi-suffused soul, giving you these powers that use your psionic energy dice. Homing Strikes. If you make an attack roll with your psychic blades and miss the target, you can roll one psionic energy die and add the number rolled to the attack roll. If this causes the attack to hit, you expend the psionic energy die. Nice. Another instance where if it doesn't work, you get to keep it anyways, yep. so who yep. cares? And this one's, my, I think, my favorite ability in this entire class. Uh, psychic Teleportation. A Teleporting Rogue. Yep. As a bonus action, <laughs> you manifest one of your Psychic Blades... Expend one psionic energy die and roll it, and throw the blade at an unoccupied space you can see, up to a number of feet away, equal to ten times the number rolled. <laughs> That's up to 120 feet at max level. Mm -hmm. You then teleport to that space, and the blade vanishes. <laughs> you know what I'd love to do? Just to be cheeky, I would hide with my action right after I do that. <laughs> And just be totally like, good. bloop, and I'm gone. You're like, where the hell did he go? Yep. He threw a knife, and he was gone. Yeah. Then, level like the 13, wind. all right, Psychic Veil. You can weave a veil of psychic static to mask yourself. As an action, you can magically become invisible, which means you could do it right after you, <laughs> you teleport. Yeah. Along with anything you are wearing or carrying for one hour or until you dismiss this effect, no action required. This, in this invisibility ends immediately after you deal damage to a creature or you force a creature to make a saving throw. Once you use oh, okay, this feature, okay. you can't do so again until you finish a long rest unless you expend a psionic energy die to use this feature again. So it's not it's not super invisibility. That, but that you can invisibility that every but you rogue can wants. Teleport and become invincible. On the same turn. Yep. <laughs> and not even have to hide, really. Just like, would you, zoom, gone. Would you, as the DM, allow the rogue to, like, have his knife when he throws that psionic, that, that first psionic blade to teleport? Would you allow him to have that be invisible or no? I don't think I would. I think I would if he went invisible first. If he went invisible first, I could yeah. understand that. Yep. It's about the order of actions. I agree with that, actually. That's a good point. Yeah. Yep. If the and homie goes invisible first, then he gets to... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but then at level 17, all right, after you've teleport invisible the way you get level 17, rend mind, mm -hmm. you can sweep your psychic blades directly through a creature's mind. When you use your psychic blades to deal sneak attack damage to a creature... By the way, you get sneak attack on your psychic blades. <laughs> oh! I mention that. <laughs> oh, okay! Yeah. So yeah. I can deal sneak attack out to 60 feet without even having a bow and arrow. Cool. Uh -huh. Yep. When you use your psychic blades to deal sneak attack damage to a creature, you can force that target to make a wisdom saving throw, which is 8 plus proficiency bonus plus dexterity modifier. If the save fails, the target is stunned for one minute. Oh my the stunned god. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect of itself on a success. Once oh you use this feature, goodness. you can't do so again until you finish a long rest, unless you expend three psionic energy dice to use it again. Oh my goodness. Jeez Louise. Okay, so this one uses three. I was like, at some point, they're going to make you spend more than one, right? Like... Like, all these things are just like, yeah, just use one of your your 12 little cheeky dice there. <laughs> I'll 
it's like eventually they're gonna make you use more than one, right? Like this is getting crazy. <laughs> yeah, oh boy. But welcome to Soul Knife Rogue. <laughs> this just I don't know why, but it just sounds so much like it looks a lot more derpy in my head in my head as a soul knife rogue doing like ranged soul knife attacks rather uh-huh. than like a normal rogue <laughs> just using a bow and arrow because I'm like because like a bow and arrow like you know they're like crouched low and they they peek over just enough to get the bow and then they lose the arrow and they immediately slink back down somewhere else but mm-hmm. as a soul knife rogue because like your knives like they glow like at least in the book of pictures and whatnot they like glow purple <laughs> so like it's not exactly the stealthiest thing so like he comes out of nowhere granted of course you know He's a rogue. Yeah. He has an incredible stealth. He comes out of nowhere. But he just it's just like this little cheeky guy just like pokes out and yucks a dagger at you <laughs> made of like <laughs> psychic energy. He's just like, yeah. <laughs> and then he's just freaking gone again. Yeah. It's just so much more like comical in my mind. It's just like <laughs> it's a lot more derpy about how he's like going about it and stuff. <laughs> Is really funny. Uh, I believe that you think that it's funny. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's all I got for you in terms of rogue today, man. Oh yeah, and I mean uh, that's that's about all the time we've got for this episode as well, because uh, you know that's that's uh, that's all that's the next three classes. That's that's all the subclasses for rogue, ranger, and paladin. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you guys wanted to find us elsewhere on on the internet, Michael, do you know where they could find us? Uh, yeah, I believe I believe you could find us on YouTube at Travelers Tips and Tales, uh, on Instagram at Travelers Tips and Tales, on Facebook at Travelers Tips and Tales, on Tumblr at Travelers Tips and Tales, uh, on Twitch at Travelers Tips and Tales. Uh, oh. You can also email us at Travelers Tips and Tales at gmail dot com. You can go to our website, travelerstipsandtails.com. dot com. Hey, hey, Mike, what what about what about Twitter? Oh, sorry, yeah, forgot. Uh, that's at Tips Tales. Um, why? And then, yeah, why is it, why is it different? Because <laughs> uh, you know, Twitter Twitter said, "I see what you're trying to do, and I'm not gonna allow it." Dude, <laughs> what bozo would do that? <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, and then we have uh, <laughs> Patreon. So if you if you like our content and you want to support us and help us uh, be able to make even better content for you guys, go to our Patreon, Travelers Tips and Tales, and you know support us. You get all kinds of cool little perks depending on you know how much you want to donate to us. Um, and yeah, Ben does a good job of posting some homebrew stuff for you guys and. Uh, we've been kind of bad about it lately, but you're supposed to get the episodes a little bit early. Uh, <laughs> about a day early. I've, I've been kind of falling apart on that one. That's all about a guys. day. <laughs> it's okay. It's uh, fine. But yeah, uh, two, two of our top patrons, uh, that we are so grateful for, uh, Dalton and Ben's mom. Of course. Hey. Very nice people. Very nice lady and gentleman. Of course. Of course. Uh, and yeah. then uh, you know they don't even utilize all of the perks that they get, so uh, that means we have just... more time to focus on the perks that you get. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But <laughs> also, uh, you know, go to your local game store if you are interested in D anD D, and you know you haven't picked up any books yet. You wanna you wanna get into it, or if you've been into it for years. And you just need a new book or a new set of dice or something, you know? Go to your local game mm-hmm. store, give yeah. them some support. Uh, our four that we actually kind of work with and everything, uh, we got Forgotten Path Games in Vacaville, Mad Alpaca Games in Fairfield, Davis Cards and Games in Davis, and Hobby Badger Games in West Sacramento. And this is all in California. Yes, California's. Um, yeah. Definitely make the effort to get in there and talk to them. I just picked up the alt cover of Candlekeep Mysteries the other day from Forgotten Paths. Same. Oh. And it's oh. uh pretty lit. <laughs> yeah. So oh. it looks really nice. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I mean, he also tried to get me to buy a bunch of other stuff while I was there and I was like, I'm broke. And then I ended up leaving with like five new sets of dice, but not the coin. <laughs> ben, you need to take me 
as well because I stop you from buying stuff. They're very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these these stores, seriously, they are amazing. They've been so kind enough to yes. allow us to kind of hang posters in there and uh, give so. give their customers our stickers. And put I milk mean, in even the fridge. that, yeah, That's, that yeah. did happen. <laughs> um, even if you're not in the California area, you know, like the middle of California, kind of like valley-ish area where we are, where you know, we give these examples for these four stores specifically, you know, go find your own. There's plenty of them out there and I'm sure there's people just as nice as the people we've met here, uh, because you know, I mean, they're just nice people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they we're really all just, are. They're we're all just gamers passionate. trying to game. <laughs> they're usually very passionate about the things that they're selling yes. and they know what they're talking about and they're honestly amazing people. We've, I encourage we've talked you, to all these guys, and they're awesome. I encourage you, even if you're, like, nervous about it, just try and, like, push yourself to go out and talk to them for, like, just just set, try and set yourself out to, like, talk to them for, like, five minutes. And you'll probably end up talking to them for, like, 15, just because you'll get into, like, a really interesting niche topic that you'll be talking about because that's what happens to me every time i walk into any of these stores and and the reason that and i we love harp it. on this so much and why we try and push this idea of go to your local game store so much is because that's how the three of us met that's how our whole group got together and yes this is true and that's Traveler's how tips and tails wouldn't be here yeah and that's also how we got the most amazing final battle final end of a campaign we've ever had that we still will not tell the story of <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have and to make that like a five-parter. <laughs> we have to bring in guests for different parts. And it also, if it weren't for that, I wouldn't right now get to say Adventure, Adventure Awaits. Awaits. Michael, shut up. <laughs> <laughs>